Okay, starting the stream now. Hello and welcome to TGIK live at uh, the Seattle office at the Heptio Studios. I am your host today, Chris Nova, and we are going to be talking about Vault. And we have some exciting updates today. This is a, a big day for everyone as we recently announced some exciting news. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But first, let's start off and look at uh, the chat. It looks like we already have a lot of people hanging out in chat, which is good. So let me scroll down here and see what we have. Looks like Waleed was our winner this week for the first TGIK chat message. Um, a decent good evening from Russia. Suresh joining from Hamburg. Uh, Waleed says, nearly midnight here in Saudi. Nearly Saturday morning. Good morning, all. Thank you for joining in the middle of the night. Hi, uh, from the other side of the world. Uh, looks like we have somebody from Berlin. Heptio says, hi, everyone. It's George. So George is going to be joining us today. Uh, he's helping me out. We have somebody from Tanzania. We have, uh, looks like maybe another person from Tanzania. How did this go? Yeah, I think so. That's cool. Uh, hello from Bosnia. George says, feel free to help out with notes. Yeah, so we have a HackMD that we do um, every week, and that's a link if you want to contribute to the notes that we will be jointly taking, and there's a lot of links and goodies in there if you want to go check it out. And again, that's always stored on the, uh, the Heptio GitHub page, which, let's just jump right in, is github.com slash heptio slash TGIK. Uh, so I just actually tweeted... Uh, this very same repo to somebody earlier. This is the uh, source of truth for TGIK. If you want to come and find an episode of TGIK, you can click here on the index and you can go see all uh, 56 previous episodes and there will be 57 um, later on today as soon as we, we wrap up with Kubernetes and Vault. Let's see what other folks are saying back in the chat. Uh, greetings from Macedonia. Saturday, two hours in Tanzania, 10 a.m. here in New Zealand. Oh, I, would, I really, really want to go to New Zealand. I'm so jealous that, like, you're there and that's a real place that people can actually go. Uh, Waleed says, congratulations on the acquisition. Uh, so we'll talk about that more in a little bit. It's, so if you have any questions, um, let's do a real quick Heptio VMware acquisition, ask me anything. Uh, feel free to drop your question in the chat and I'll spend the first five or so minutes uh, answering the best of my ability and I'll give a little like state of uh, how things are and what's going on and tell you folks everything that I know and yada yada. Uh, so let's see what else other people are saying. Hello from Serbia. Uh, looks like we have boring old New York City here. Hey Darren. Uh, Tim says watcha. We have Robel. Hello from London. We have AJ from Iraq. Joy joined. Alex Richards. Hello from Wales. Uh, hello from Sweden. Uh, Peter in Sweden. Let's see. Paz will drop Gardner for Kate's. Oh, uh, I think that's a question. Uh, hi from Copenhagen. More from London and somebody from Portugal. And I'm sure there's more. Uh, yeah, we just had somebody drop in. Greetings from Houston. So folks joining from all over the world, thank you for joining, whether it's Friday afternoon, Friday morning, Saturday morning, or whatever. If you're like in New Zealand or Australia, I think it's the future there. Uh, so thank you so much for joining. It's good to see everyone. And a uh, friendly reminder that you can always go to the GitHub repo and watch the episodes afterwards. And I personally like to turn it up to two times the speed so I can get through about an hour and 45 minutes of TGIK in about uh, whatever half of that would be. Uh, 45, yeah, 45 minutes? Yeah, no, close. But yeah, it's twice as fast. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Hi from Dusseldorf, Germany, and hello from New Hampshire. And then it looks like we have somebody from Perth and somebody from snowy Boston. It is snowing in other parts of America right now. It's not snowing here in Seattle. It's actually just doing its normal boring old rain that it always does this time of year. Uh, Abdemner says, no, Chris, we prefer live streaming. Uh, Waleed, I think, is clarifying their question that says, Pivotal paths and Concourse, among other products, will they drop their custom orchestration and focus on Kate's? I don't have any good concrete information on what is happening inside VMware yet. We're technically still Heptio. We just know that there's a deal that's supposed to close, and you, you can find out more information about all of that. Um, in, let's go ahead and jump into it in this wonderful uh, link we have here. So let's share my screen. And if you go to our HackMD, uh, one of the first links here, it says VMware update from Craig. So you can actually come in and uh, let me close some of these. You can actually get Craig's perspective. So this is a good thing to read and it sort of talks about why and what life has been like 
here at Heptio and uh, how we have a lot of things in common with VMware. So if you want to come read and get like the, uh, the CEO, it doesn't get any more honest than that, get their opinion on what's going on. This is a really, really great uh, article. Uh, let's see, Angel says, will the VMware acquisition affect TGIK? Uh, so yes, no, the VMware acquisition will not affect TGIK in any negative way. If anything, it's going to make it better because we might have uh, more resources to help uh, ramp up TGIK in some, in some way. I don't really know what that would look like, but uh, no, VMware loves TGIK. We're going to keep doing it. You're not going to get rid of me and Joe that easily. Um, it's just we might have some different branding on the TGIK page or something. I'm assuming that's going to be the, the only uh, change. Also, I'm assuming that we'll be playing with some more VMware goodies in the near future. So stay tuned for like some TGIKs on vSphere and Kubernetes. And it's going to get pretty exciting pretty quickly, I feel like. OK, so let's go back to our reference links here. OK, so this first one um, here, I kind of did like a funny little said joke, which is said, replace Heptio with VMware. And really, uh, I should update my said syntax. We want to do like a uh, uh, replace Heptio with like Heptio plus VMware as we're going to kind of be working in, in concert together, making things work well. So that's going to be exciting. Uh, let's see what folks are saying in the chat. I've seen a lot of movement and I have like multiple screens where like I have to look down to read the chat and look up to actually see what's going on here. Uh, so Mark says plus one on Craig's blog. So yeah, it looks like Mark's already read it. Uh, Olaf says few. Uh, Alex says yay for Chris and Joe. Thanks, Alex. Uh, uh, Angel says awesome. I wasn't planning. Uh, to anyways, let's keep going. And uh, Waleed has more questions, it looks like. Uh, TGIK on Pivotal Concourse CICD would be interesting. Uh, Waleed, if you want to, let's pull it up again. Heptio TGIK. If you want to open up an issue, and this actually is for everyone, come to the issue tracker and like real quick, let's just drop in all of the VMware stuff uh, that we want to see in the future for TGIK if you have an idea, and we can create a label for that, and maybe those can be some of the first exciting episodes um, after everything is kind of like sealed and locked down. Uh, let's see, Leonardo says hi from Brazil, so it's good to see folks. Let's go back to our index here and see what else we have. Okay, so our first one here is uh, Kubernetes 1.13 Alpha 3 is out. Uh, and what that means to me as a Kubernetes maintainer is it's code freeze time. And again, I feel like I've said this like six times on TGIK now, but somehow a release snuck up on us again. We're already at 1.13 and that's in code freeze. Um, and I think there was some updates on that in the community meeting earlier this week. Uh, so if you want to uh, uh, learn more about 1.13 and see what's going on, the community meeting was pretty cool. Uh, we got a demo on Palomi. I think I said that right which was exciting. And actually, George, I'm going to pick on you. If you could drop a community meeting recording link here, if folks are interested in seeing uh, what's going on in the community, that would be pretty, pretty rad as well. OK, so next we have the VMware update from Craig. Uh, and then I wanted to share this just because like, I'm going to get a little sappy and emotional here. Um, this was my original picture of joining Heptio, which is in the room right next door. And this was the first company I've worked at for over a year. So like, just really excited to be here. And it's been a crazy year. Um, and not in my life, just in like the past, you know, four or five years, I've, I've made a lot of changes in my career and I finally feel like I'm home. And it's exciting to, uh, to be a part of this whole thing. So that's my sappy emotion a little bit. Um, anyway, there's some good sparkly pictures of me, Joe and Craig, if you wanna go check them out. Okay, so next up we have Dockerbox. So Seth pinged me. Um, okay, looks like George put the community meeting link in chat if folks want to see. Okay, so Seth pinged me and said, hey, I have this new open source tool. Do you want to check it out? Um, so I'm super swamped. So I was like, oh, hey, we can totally take a look at this thing on, on TGIK. So I think this is supposed to basically be just like BusyBox, but for, for Docker only. Um, which let's look at the uh, instructions here. Uh, oh my gosh. So first things first, I love the single sentence at the beginning of a repo. I've said that a few times, but like the software engineer in me is like, ah, it's a single concrete sentence that says what this thing is and nothing more and no reasons why we created it and just what it is. Uh, looks like George says we publish them to a playlist every week. So it's a great way to subscribe and get updates. Um, and let's see, Icarus has found you. Hello from San Francisco. Okay, cool. So let's see, it says by default, the Docker box config lives in home Docker box. And you can do a go get github.com Seth, Seth Pollock Docker box. Let's try this and see what happens. 
I, Seth is, uh, I wouldn't say a close friend, but we've worked together in open source, so I'm going to go ahead and trust that Seth isn't writing anything malicious here. Let's go back. Um, then it says export path. So we're going to put uh, Docker box bin. We're going to add that to the end of our path. So that's that. Um, and then he says add a registry.yaml. So let's do this to home Docker box registry.yaml. So let's do change directory home Docker box. Oh, we're going to do a make dir. Make dir home Docker box. And then we want to change directory Docker box slash registry.yaml. We'll do nano here just because my Emacs takes forever to open up. OK. Um, and a local config. I want to be real quick here. I don't want to spend too much time on this. Uh, let's see. Local.yaml. Wait, where does that need to go? Home Docker box local.yaml. So nano Docker box local.yaml. Bam. Cool. To update your applet cache, run Docker box update. So there should be a binary now. So let's see, Docker box. Okay, this is cool. So this is just like another Go program that you can use um, to basically uh, serve as like a, a busy box for Docker, which that's super rad. And you can see the full applet spec. And here's some usage, Docker box. You can do help install. You can uh, list all of the available applets. And you can uninstall and you can update. And it looks like I was able to get uh, Docker box up and running in about 15 or 20 seconds. So if folks are interested in this project, check it out. Uh, Seth is in the Kubernetes Slack. And I know he's looking for feedback. So if we want to give him some feedback, that would be rad. Cool. So next up, we have uh, Heptio intro to Kubernetes and containers. So here at Heptio, which we still are for at least another couple of weeks here, uh, we have uh, corporate training. And I think this is one of our uh, corporate training offerings that we have. So it looks like it's like an afternoon with Kubernetes. Um, every once in a while, I'll pop into one of these things and kind of do like a surprise guest, guest appearance and just kind of hang out with folks and get to know how people are using Kubernetes. But these are really fun. It's a great way to learn from uh, Kubernetes experts here at Heptio. And if you or your company is interested, uh, you can ping me or ping Joe, and we can connect you with folks on our end, and you can learn more. And you can buy tickets here, it looks like. Uh, Joe says, I got it dropped, but George has the details on the swag giveaway. Oh, from our internal Slack. Uh, Slack. So yeah, I, I guess Joe did like a giveaway the other day, which sounded really exciting. I think I was rock climbing in Utah whenever he did it. Um, but yeah, I have no idea how that works. So maybe we can figure that out if we have time at the end of the episode. Uh, let's see. Um, AJ says you can use CD underscore uh, dollar sign to change the directory to the newly created directory. And Bob says, hello from Smoky Hollywood. Uh, <laughs> please help the fire people if you can. Uh, Bob brings up a great point. The What's going on in California is horrible. Uh, so many people, unfortunately, have died. And it's been really, really scary for a lot of my uh, close friends down there. So yeah, if there's anything you can do to help, uh, it looks like Bob can give, give you some pointers if you need some. Heptio says, I'm figuring out the swag giveaway. Uh, stand by. Awesome. So let's go back here. Um, so this one I wanted to bring up. Uh, I think it was two HashiCorp or HashiComps ago, uh, Kelsey did um, the vault on Kubernetes, and I did uh, Terraform on Kubernetes. And uh, this is his repo of getting vault up and running on Kubernetes. And when we actually go and install vault here in a moment, I think we're going to do the CoreOS operator because it's a little bit quicker. So for time's sake, we're going to start there. But there's some interesting differences uh, between what Kelsey has put together and what the CoreOS operator actually does. And we'll be able to kind of look at those side by side. Um, the big one is, if you actually look in here, Kelsey runs a stateful set for, uh, for vault. Um, whereas the core OS operator runs a deployment. So there's some interesting paradigms behind why you would uh, possibly want to do a stateful set to ensure that one pod is running on each of your nodes. Um, and it's a curious design choice that the core OS uh, has done a deployment um, for something as critical as a secret store. So just pros and cons uh, and subtle differences there. Uh, David says, yay for operators. And Z uh, I'm sorry if I could say this name wrong. Zolt says, hello from Finland. And we have somebody joining from from Austin as well. And hold on, I'm going to catch my breath and have some monster that I picked up earlier today. 
okay, rad. So that's Kelsey's uh, vault on Kubernetes. Um, well, it's specific to Google. So if you don't want to run on Google, this is just going to kind of get you thinking the right way, but maybe you won't be able to copy and paste everything as this is specific to Google. But you can go in, you can actually see all of the commands you need to run. And when you get all the way down here to the end, do, 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 here's the expose the vault cluster. And uh, here's how you set up a load balancer in front of it. So just to kind of give folks a quick idea of what vault is and how it works, um, it's a uh, secret store plus auth plus does some other stuff as well. Um, we'll get into the nitty gritty here in a bit when we start going through the uh, documentation. But ultimately, uh, you interact with Vault over an API, which is why we need this load balancer here. So it's a very simple client server model. Um, and we will be actually running the server components in Kubernetes. Kelsey did it with a stateful set. Uh, the CoreOS operator uses a deployment. Um, and so yeah, after you expose that, you can then come down here and actually uh, turn on secrets and start sharing secrets. Here's a put and here's a get and an example of sharing some secret information. Uh, Aaron says, when you have a translator, I would be curious to hear your thoughts on Vault on Kubernetes as you're demonstrating today versus Bitnami Labs sealed secrets. Uh, I have never actually looked at Bitnami Labs sealed secrets. Uh, so I can't really speak super intelligently about it just yet. I'm assuming you're talking about this thing here, which let's see what this thing does. Problem, I can manage all of my Kate's config and Git except secrets. Solution, encrypt your secret into a sealed secret, which is safe, yada, yada, yada. Okay, so this just looks like it's another secret store that sort of solves the same problem as Vault, but in a Kubernetes specific way. Um, I am now interested in this. I'm gonna add a link here to remind myself, maybe we can do a, a TGIK on this later. But unfortunately, uh, I won't be able to speak super intelligently about it now, other than my th overall thoughts, which I think anytime you have diversity in, uh, in tooling, it pushes the tooling further and hardens the tooling. And also, as we're about to learn, the, uh, the Kubernetes story on Vault isn't super fleshed out. I couldn't even find uh, an example of what we're going to be doing today. So as far as I know, and as far as my research showed, I'm the first one to actually put together an int in test of using the uh, Kubernetes auth method in Vault, which is in the TGIK repo. And we'll merge that after the episode. And we'll look at that here in a moment. moment. Uh, Aaron says, I appreciate it. Thanks. You're very welcome, Aaron. OK, so I mentioned the Vault operator. So let's look at this now. Do do uh, run and manage Vault on Kubernetes simply and securely. Uh, it is, I guess it's in beta. And just a heads up is it does have a dependency on the etcd operator. And we see that dependency here when we install Vault. We'll, uh, we'll actually install an etcd cluster that it uses. Um, and in general, I think the etcd operator, I want to say it's deprecated or unsupported, unsupported. So it's basically abandonware at this point. Let's see, etcd operator. Let's see what the repo has to say. I don't want to misquote our friends at CoreOS. Uh, so this is also in beta. So anyway, just be aware that I don't know if this is being actively maintained or not. Uh, it looks like our commits here were three months ago, seven months ago, two years ago, four months ago. So we haven't really seen anything in the past three or four months here on this repo as well. Uh, so just a little bit of awareness there that you are possibly uh, getting uh, a dependency involved that may not have the most updated uh, code in it if you do decide to use the core OS operator here. OK, so here's Kelsey's thing. Let's close that. Here's the vault operator. Do, do, do. So we'll look at that in a second. And we're actually going to start, and we're going to go through this readme. So if you want to start looking at that readme now, uh, feel free to. OK, so next up is dynamic secrets. And I was talking to Joe a little bit about this today. This is a, this is a blog by Armin, the CEO of HashiCorp. Uh, and this talks about why he thinks it's a good idea to have dynamic secrets. And basically, a dynamic secret is a secret that is started at run, it's like generated at runtime as you need it. So your program would start, you would enter the main function, you would say, I need a secret, and there would be some system in place that would give you the secret you need, and it would handle authenticating that on the back end so your secret actually works as well. And as soon as uh, you're done with that secret and your program exits, that secret is no longer uh, used, which sounds very good for anybody who's ever um, uh, concerned themselves with security and auth before. That sounds like a, a solid model. Let's see what folks are saying. Um, Sean Smith says, hey, from Seattle. Sorry I'm late. Congrats on the acquisition and the great work, everyone at Heptio. Thank you, Sean. 
Uh, let's see. Sima says, why are you not speaking in KubeCon China this year? Uh, it's honestly, because I'm transgender and that scares me. <laughs> if you want to know the truth, uh, it's not always easy for me to travel around the world, especially with some of the legal issues in different places. And um, yeah, I uh, just felt safer here, uh, which is weird to say because obviously, well, anyway, uh, yeah, that's why I didn't go to China. Okay, so let's see. Uh, Kubernetes RBAC. We're going to be talking about RBAC a little bit uh, today. You're going to have to have a pretty good idea of what a service account is. So if you want to go refresh on RBAC, here's the page on it. I might draw a picture and just go over uh, cluster roles, cluster role bindings, uh, users, groups, and service accounts in a little bit once they're relevant to what we're doing in Vault. Uh, so there's that as well. Here, OK, this is a good one. This was actually like one of the r rare gems in Kubernetes. So we're going to get into this later, but we needed to find the service account token. And when we actually look at uh, getting a pod up and running with the vault in a moment, you'll see why this is relevant. Um, and I actually could not find documentation on Kubernetes.io for this, but I did find this like hidden piece of documentation here in client go that reminds you that it's in var run secrets Kubernetes IO service account. So if you're ever looking for this magic path to get your service account token out of a pod, it's here uh, in the client go <laughs> repository. Okay, so next one is, okay, this is Shamir's secret which we'll look at that in a second, but this is the Wikipedia article uh, about the actual math behind uh, how Vault seals and unseals itself. And when we install Vault, we'll have to talk about sealing and unsealing our, our Vault and what that means and what the implications are with that. But if you're an algorithm nerd and you want to go check out uh, how this whole thing works, there's uh, some pretty interesting math here about how you can uh, shard out your different secrets to create one uh, more powerful master key. And that's called Shamir Secret Sharing. Uh, OK, it looks like we have dynamic secrets on here twice. And this last one is uh, sealed secrets, which somebody mentioned earlier. OK, so we're already 22 minutes in. So I'm going to kind of close a lot of this. And we're going to jump right into uh, getting Vault up and running with the CoreOS Vault operator. OK, so first things first, let's check out my cluster and see what we have running. Uh, so let's get out of Docker box. Let's go back to my home directory. And uh, we all know my alias kdump, which just does a cubectal get all dash dash all namespaces. So I'm going to run that, and we're going to see what we have running in my cluster. Uh, I just spun this cluster up with cubicorn. It should be pretty bare bones, but I want to make sure I didn't leave anything in here because I did install Vault earlier today. Let's see. This all looks good. I don't see anything in here other than like the Kubernetes uh, minimum set of things you need to get a cluster up and running. OK, cool. Um, so let's go back here. And we're going to go uh, start running these commands and going through deploying the etcd operator to get started. Um, and so right here it says kubectl create minus f. And then you can see example etcd crds.yaml. If you actually check out this repository, um, you'll notice there's the example directory. And these are the YAML bits we're actually going to be running. Uh, Abdebnor says, have we here who is certified for uh, offensive security? I hope explain more of the algo of Shamir. Uh, I'm not sure I quite understand your question. Uh, maybe you could try to reword it, and I can uh, try to answer it. If you want me to go a little bit deeper, uh, I can whenever we get to sealing and unsealing our, our vault there. OK, so anyway, here's the YAML bits that we're going to be checking out. So I uh, checked out that repository. So we go to my go path, which is home slash go, uh, github, oh, source, github.com, coreos, uh, vault operator. There we go. And so here you can see we actually have the uh, example directory. So these can wait, Cedric says, what was the tool called to spin up a cluster? Uh, so Cedric, I have a tool that I also abandon where. I'll call myself out. That's totally fine. Um, called Cubicorn. And all it does is it creates uh, infrastructure and then runs cube admin on top of it and just kind of automates everything. So it's a really simple way to get a cube admin Kubernetes cluster running in Amazon or DigitalOcean or a handful of others. Um, if you're interested in using this, uh, it's going to involve uh, running two commands, first to create, then an apply. And uh, I have a whole TGIK episode on Cubicorn if you're interested in learning more through there. Oh, sorry, excuse me. I have to like sneeze really quick. I don't want to like blow my nose on camera. Hold on. OK. 
Cedric says, aw, thanks. Uh, and other folks are saying Cubicorn as well. Um, and then honestly, I really like our uh, Cubicorn.io. Uh, I really like our docs page. Like it's really pretty and colorful and rainbowy and makes me happy. But there's some good information here too of uh, getting Cubicorn and how it's different than some of the other things and yada, yada, yada. Okay, so that's Cubicorn and how I set up my cluster. So back to our vault operator. Okay, so Cubectal create etcd CRDs. So let's go and let's take a look at those. And I'm trying to think, do we want to, we can open this stuff in Emacs, that's fine. Uh, actually, no, let's just cat it out here. That'll, that'll make the most sense. Okay, so example, uh, etcd, what do we want? We wanted the CRDs first. So clear my screen and cat out our etcd CRDs and see what we have. Uh, so the first one here is a uh, custom resource definition, which it, that's what CRD stands for. And it defines uh, this kind called an etcd cluster. And then we have uh, another CRD, another CRD. So nothing too uh, promiscuous here. And again, this is just for the etcd operator stuff. So I'm not gonna spend too terribly much time uh, looking at the etcd operator. If you wanna go check that out, we can talk about that at a later time. Okay, so the next one is the operator deploy. So this will be the actual operator itself. And again, we all are familiar with the operator pattern, which is you have a CRD, which represents what, and then you have an operator that reconciles that and brings it to life. So this first one was just a description of what we want, and then this is a, uh, an actual piece of software that's gonna go and reconcile that. In this case, we're declaring that we want an etcd data store to be running in Kubernetes. So we can go ahead and run uh, both of these and get etcd up and running. So here we created our CRDs, and I guess I'll be a good girl and cat out example etcd uh, operator deploy. Oh, this was another nitpick of mine. Uh, all of the etcds have underbars um, after their name, except for this first one that has a hyphen. Uh, so kind of annoying for us Unix users who really enjoy consistency. Anyway, if you cut this out. Uh, you can see that it's real simple. It's just a deployment, and it just runs a pod, uh, which is the etcd operator version 0.8.3. And then it's got some loose information about how to actually start up the operator. So again, this is just the software that's going to start up etcd for us. Uh, let's see. We have, hello, everyone. I am Mishra from HashiCorp. First off, thank you, Chris, for doing this. Also, we have a vault helm charts coming soon, hopefully making installing stuff easier. Uh, awesome. Thanks for the update. Uh, I think I'm just going to say a, a noob. Have? I'm sorry, I'm really sorry if I uh, mispronounced your name, but that's good to know. Um, there's a lot of thoughts around Helm charts and the dependency on Helm and how those compare to operators. I myself am a big fan of having uh, an operator. I really think the CoreOS operator is a great example of how to declare uh, not only one, but in number of uh, vault clusters running in Kubernetes. And you can bake a lot more logic into the operator that you uh, would be missing from just starting a simple Helm chart. Um, although I guess you could use a Helm chart to launch an operator, but that just seems a bit um, like there's a lot of complexity going on there. Anyway, uh, oh, Misha goes by my last name. Okay, cool. So that makes it easier for me to pronounce. Thank you, Misha. Okay, cool. So we have our uh, etcd operator. So let's go ahead and install that. It's just a deployment. Um, and we looked at that real briefly. Okay, so now we should have kgit po, which of course is an alias for kubectl git pods. Uh, for folks who are just joining us, I have a lot of aliases I sometimes use and folks aren't aware of them. Uh, so if you run kgit po or kubectl git pods, you can see that we have an etcd operator. Oh, and it's in crash loop back off. This is good. Um, I'm not going to pull the logs. I'm going to keep going through the install because I want folks to see how this works sort of linearly. Um, but now we want to deploy the, uh, the vault operator. And I think the reason that we're in crash loop back off, and I wanted to mention this linearly, is because I missed this first step here. Uh, let's see, crash container is restarting. Um, so Aid says, the whole go mod thing was confusing to me. Francesca did a great video tutorial breaking it down if folks are interested. Uh, and Waleed says, Red Hat has an operator for Helm in OpenShift. Um, not sure what it is really. Okay, so good commentary there from our friends. So anyway, uh, this is actually step one. This is not step one. <laughs> uh, we need to set up our back, and that's why uh, I'm assuming why the etcd operator is failing right now. So we're going to create a role in a role binding. And this is going to be important because this is going to bind us to our service account, which is going to be uh, how we do everything in Vault once we get the Kubernetes auth up and running. 
Uh, so if we look here, it's a simple side command, and it's just replacing this sort of bracketed namespace and this bracketed service account with default and default, and then renaming the file from RBAC template to example rbac.yaml. So we can actually copy and paste this, run that, and now we can actually cut out example rbac.yaml, and we can actually see down here at the bottom, we've actually injected uh, name and namespace and you can see here, uh, we're actually binding to the default service account for the default namespace, and we're naming this uh, the vault operator role. These are gonna be important values later, so just remember them, uh, and you can always come back and see how we got them. So let's go ahead and create our RBAC rules in Kubernetes. So we do that by k apply minus f, example, the file we just created, rbac.yaml, and that's gonna go and say, yes, we've created our authorization and our role binding. And a friendly reminder for folks, there's, there's two types of role bindings in Kubernetes. There's a regular role binding, which is what we see here. And then we also have a cluster role binding, which has a broader scope. Um, cluster role bindings will bind uh, some type of uh, either a service account or a user or a group to uh, the entire cluster instead of just a specific namespace. So uh, things like nodes that don't really exist at the namespace level are gonna be relevant when you start looking at cluster role bindings. And again, the binding is just how you connect the role to uh, uh, the, the group or the user. Okay, so let's see what David is saying. So no problem, always glad to answer OpenShift questions. Okay, Brad, thank you for your help, David. Okay, so now I bet if we do a kgit po, Yes, our etcd operator is running. So um, remember to always set up your RBAC rules first. So going back to this, and that's a bit like, I would rather see the, the RBAC, that little snippet that is on this page. I would rather see this linearly here instead of having to navigate away just as a, as a user, it makes it easier for me. Um, okay, so we've created the example. CRDs, we've deployed our operator. So now let's get started with vaults. So first we create the vault CRD, which again, because we're creating a vault operator, we also have to create a vault CRD. So let's really take a look at this. So cat example vault CRD.yaml. So it's a custom resource definition and it's called a vault service. And it's uh, vault services is its plural. And basically all a CRD does is just create this new entity that you can be whatever you want and your operator can read it later. Okay, so going back here, we will go ahead and create that in a moment. And then it says deploy the vault operator. So this is the deployment here. And I wanna kind of do a quick side-by-side -side of this and Kelsey Hightower's one. So we can do cat example deployment.yaml. And let's actually, I'll just check out Kelsey's repo. Kelsey Hightower vault. And then we'll, uh, we can cat them both out and actually look at them next to each other. Uh, so yeah, we wanna grab the URL and we'll clone that. Uh, and this is another cool tool. If I use this thing all the time. If you don't uh, use it, it makes your life way easier. I just forked Kelsey Hightower's repo to Chris Nova, downloaded it, and if I actually go uh, to my go path, source github.com core OS, uh, vault operator, oh, it got checked out to the wrong place, but we can fix that. Um, we then want to move vault to go source github.com Kelsey Hightower. Uh, nope, I did that wrong. Move, sorry, one second. Source github.com Kelsey Hightower. Move that to go source github.com Kelsey Hightower vault on Google Kubernetes engine. Um, you can't do that. So we'll just look at it here. Uh, go source github.com Kelsey Hightower. Okay, anyway, it doesn't really matter where it's checked out. But if you want to, you can cut out this vault.yaml file. And we can see his stateful set here. And we'll do a side by side. Um, oh, let me blow this up. Uh, go source github.com core OS vault operator cat example uh, deployment.yaml. So there's the vault operator. 
and here's his stateful set. So you can see the complexity here. Uh, he's doing a lot of configuration and stateful set. I'm assuming a lot of this is specific to Google. Um, and then also we're ensuring that each one of our vault pods runs on a node with Kelsey's example, whereas ours can be disparate across a number of different nodes. So a lot of folks who are using some sort of secret store, like this is the keys to the kingdom here. Uh, so having uh, guarantees like running them on every node or having a sharded cluster in case something goes wrong so you can like uh, have a backup of your data. These are all important things that folks are considering when they're looking at how they're installing Vault. Uh, personally, I would have rather opted into a stateful set because I like the idea of knowing that there's a layer of software running on each of my nodes that has all the keys to the kingdom. Um, and I would even start to entertain the idea of possibly running Vault out of my cluster so that we have a separation of concerns there as well. So these are just things to think about as you and your team are figuring out if it actually makes sense for you to run your Vault cluster inside of Kubernetes itself. Um, so anyway, that's my spiel on how to set up Vault. OK, so we're back here to our operator. Let's make sure, yeah, we're still in the root directory. And let's go in and actually install this stuff. So let's create our Vault operator CRD. Bam. And let's go and deploy the operator itself. Vault operator. Very good. And then it says verify that the operators are running. So we do a kgit po. And we see, yes, we have an etcd operator. And yes, we have a Vault operator. What's interesting to call out is we actually don't have Vault running yet because we have to declare our first Vault cluster for the operator to reconcile. Uh, looks like folks are in chat. Sean Smith says, oh my god, clone looks great. Time to look at it for myself. Uh, Sean Smith, just a heads up, I wrote that tool like two years ago. So it's like I was a different engineer back then. Don't get mad at me. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's an ancient tool. Um, anyway, uh, Misha says, also using auto unseal feature that was released as part of Vault 1.0.0. It makes bootstrapping the Vault cluster easier. Uh, OK, uh, so Mishra, I'm not sure where you're getting that from. But anyway, it uh, looks like folks are kind of having some side banter in the, uh, the chat. If somebody has a question, feel free to just highlight me or type Chris. OK, so the Vault operator is now installed. And let's deploy our first Vault cluster. So to do that, we do a create minus f example vault dot yaml. So let's actually, I'll emacs this uh, example example vault yaml and we might change a few things about this opening up my big giant emacs program here which takes forever okay so let's change this name from example to tgik vault yes so now we can do a k apply minus f example uh, example vault yaml uh, and it says yes uh, the vault service TG tgik vault was created so now we can actually do kgit vault. And you can see we have a resource called vault. And we can actually have one or more of these. And each one of these actually represent our vault cluster. So now if we do a kgit PO, you can see that we actually, the operator has scheduled pods in the same namespace and uh, implicitly the same service account. So uh, let me see what other people are saying. Sean Smith says, haha, it's fine regarding clone. I mostly use GitLab, so it wouldn't work for someone like me to use it. Darren says, not that you should ever run a container from somebody in the internet, but I've updated an image of the Vault operator to Vault uh, for Darwin. OK, so actually, Darren brings up a really good point. If you, I'm going to pick on Kelsey again. If you go and you look at Kelsey's repo, I noticed this the other day. Uh, I, I want to grep for Hightower Labs. Uh, so you can see here, he's actually pulling uh, this Vault init pod that we have no idea what this is. And we have no idea how it's getting built. Um, although I'm sure Kelsey has done uh, his homework and has like a copy of his Docker file somewhere and has been a, a good engineer. I just don't see a Docker file here in this repo. So there's a little bit of like black magic going on that I'm sort of detached from. Uh, so just, again, concerns going off of what Darren said about just blindly running containers from people on the internet. Um, it's pretty much the same as just downloading a static binary and just running it and hoping that whoever created the binary didn't put anything malicious into it. Uh, but that's really, really easy to do. OK. Uh, so An or Amishra says, Kelsey's project uses the auto unseal feature is what I meant. Sorry, the chat is lagging behind a few seconds. OK, so Amishra uh, just hit another point that I should bring up. Uh, because the chat does lag behind, the complete sentences are super helpful so that we, we can sort of communicate back and forth. So really appreciated. Thanks for elaborating, Misha. Um, and Darren says, especially security software. 
Okay, I'm assuming that's another case of the chat lagging behind because I don't understand what especially security software means uh, at this particular moment. <laughs> okay, uh, so let's go back here um, to the vault operator. Okay, so we can now get pods. Uh, let's just go ahead and see how these things are doing. So k get PO. Beautiful. I love when everything just says running like that and everything's ready and it like looks all happy. It's like really, really exciting. Okay, so you can see now we've got a few things. So we've got the vault operator, which again, this is the layer of software that schedules vault itself. Then we've got two vault etcds that were created uh, by the vault operator as a data store or three of them. Um, and then we have two vault pods themselves. So this is actually where Vault is running. It's in these pods. And if we actually go and pull logs on them, um, minus F, oh, we also have to specify a container, minus C, um, we'll do Vault, the Vault container. You can see here that we've actually, uh, we're actually running the Vault software. So if you actually go to the HashiCorp, uh, Vault, HashiCorp, Vault website, there's a, um, little installation section, and that's what this uh, this pod is currently doing. So let's see, uh, overview, I think we wanna go to overview. Maybe? No, I'm not sure. Uh, let's see, uh, Kubernetes auth method, yeah, this is where we wanna go. Uh, so installing vault right here. Um, so vault project.io docs install index.html. This is actually what the pod is doing is it's, it's gone through and it's in, done an installation or it's probably already baked in and it's actually uh, running vault for us. So that's where vault itself is running. Uh, so then if we go back to our vault operator, um, let's see, it says get the vault pods, check the vault CR status. Okay, so this is an, another good thing we probably wanna check out. Um, because we're doing an operator, and again, this is a huge benefit to operators over like a static deployment, like a Helm chart. Um, if we actually do a k get vault OYAML, uh, not only do we get a ton of really handy meta information uh, about what is actually going on, and we can see things like uh, if we have annotations and when it was created and what namespace it's running in, but more importantly, we have the status section down here where it actually gives us really handy information like, oh, it's running on port 8200, uh, and it, the cluster itself is not initialized. So this is specific vault information that Kubernetes is giving us, that the operator is able to sort of be the liaison between what's going on in the pod and what us as an operator get to interact with. So you would, you would totally miss all of this if you, uh, if you didn't install what's just something like Helm without an operator. You would have no way of knowing the current status of what's going on in your cluster. So if you wanted to see if Vault was running, you would probably do something like do a Cubecto logs and just see if, if it looks like Vault is running, whereas here you can get a ton of more information and actually build stuff in automatically with software, which is handy. Uh, so yeah, it says phase running, service name, TGIK Vault. Okay, cool. So Vault is now up and running. And it says using the Vault cluster. So we can go here to the Vault Usage Guide. Again, here, I'm gonna go back and do this again. Uh, it's right here. It's under the Using the Vault Cluster Vault Usage, usage Guide. This is, uh, this is like where I spent most of my time as I was learning about Vault earlier this week. Um, it talks about using the Vault CLI. Um, David says, great tip on the OYAML. Um, yeah, we're gonna get to, so Abdemnor says, export Vault Adder in chat. So as we go through all this, you'll actually see that we're gonna have uh, a lot of environmental variables we'll export along the way. But anyway, this is good because it talks about getting the Vault CLI up and running. And before beginning, you have to create the a, a default example Vault cluster, which again, we renamed TGIK. Uh, so to download the Vault CLI, you come here. I did pre-compiled binary and then you can click this download button and you can see HashiCorp always does a really, really great job at offering downloads and they'll detect what operating system and architecture you're running on. And they always build, like I think more so than any other open source team, they always build a ton of different architectures. I mean, they even offer a vault on Solaris here, which is pretty insane. Uh, so hats off to them. So anyway, you would download that binary, move it to your path, uh, probably chmod it to executable, and then you should be able to just type vault. 
Yay, so vault's up and running. So if I try to do a vault status right now, you can see that uh, that's one of these secondary commands here in our very familiar Go, uh, Go program output. If I try to do a vault status, we're going to get an error, and it's going to say checking still status, get HTTPS, uh, unable to dial TCP. If, you, if you've written Golang, this little connect connection refused, that's very familiar. That's coming out of the Go standard library. So what that's telling me is for some reason we can't talk to the vault cluster, which we cannot because we haven't poked a hole. Uh, well, we're not really poking a hole in a firewall. We're doing some port forwarding from my local to the Kubernetes cluster. But if we go back to, let's go back, what, like four or five pages here. Uh, we go here, we can actually see that this handy command here will actually do the port forwarding for us. Ah, let me go back. Um, where did this thing go? Vault operator, vault usage guide again. Um, and let's see what this command does. So it says git vault, and then it does uh, JSON path, and it's going to pull the uh, status sealed, pipe it to XARG, uh, and then do a port forward on it. So basically, this is going to look up our vault cluster and do a port forward on port 8200 for us in one uh, fell swoop, which is super handy. Uh, vault services, core OS example not found. So let's see, git vault. We want to change this to TGIK. Uh, what was it? K git vault. Oh, it's called TGIK dash vault. So let's go back. Default git vault. A lot of vault. I, I feel like the word vault is slowly losing meaning. I keep saying it. OK, perfect. OK, so now we're forwarding port 8200 um, onto the uh, Cubectal uh, port forwarding. So we should be able to actually hit the Vault API now. So let's open up a second uh, window here. Zoom in for folks at home. And now we can run a Vault status um, because it doesn't contain any IP SANs. Uh-oh. Uh, error copying from local connection to remote stream, read TCP4, connection reset by peer. This did not happen last time. I wonder if it's because I changed the, let's go back and change our name back to example if something's baked into the example all along the way. Uh, so let's do change directory, go source github.com, go back to CoreOS, vault operator, emacs example. Uh, Mike says HTTPS. So I'm, I'm assuming Mike says, is suggesting that uh, we're using the wrong protocol here. I'm going to go back and just do apples to apples because I had this thing working earlier. And if that doesn't work, we can poke around and see if it's HTTP or HTTPS or what's going on. This just worked out of the box for me earlier. So don't want to spend too much time fighting with TLS if we don't need to. Uh, OK, so Emacs example, what was it? It was, what's in here? Example vault.yaml. So let's change this to back to example. Save and exit. Uh, K delete vault. And I guess this is a really good example of why operators are also a better pattern, because you can create and delete clusters very easily now that you have the operator up and running. Uh, so K delete vault, uh, we called it TGIK vault. And let's go ahead and K apply. And we're going to create the example vault um, with, the, with the older name to see if that fixes our little problem here for us. OK, so example, example vault.yaml. Cool. So if we k get PO, you can see we're terminating some of the old ones, and we're probably about to start bringing up some of our new ones. Uh, so yeah, here's our example at CD. So the operator is slowly tearing down some pods and slowly bringing up some others. Uh, and hope, I'm hoping that that's going to fix our vault problem here. Uh, so let's run this command. Again, but this time we're going to be running with git vault example instead of git vault tgik vault. Let's run that and see what happens. OK, so what happened is that pod is not up and running yet, so that command did not work. So let's do a kgit po and see where we are. OK, so the example etcd is still initializing. So we've got a few seconds here um, to wait on vault coming up. Uh, any questions from anybody so far? Um, about how we've gotten here and how the operator is working and how we're getting our cluster set up. Feel free to ask now. Um, and we'll continue to wait for the operator. Hey, that looks happy.
<sighs> okay. So now let's try our port forward command again. Yay, so now we have 8200. So let's go back to the second tab and do a vault status. Snope still having, uh, cannot validate certificate because it does not contain any IP SANS. Uh, so it looks like Heptio is saying now would be a good time to enter this swag giveaway. TGIK roll call. The code for the episode is carabiner. That's awesome. I wonder if I actually have a carabiner on me. I think I have some at my desk. I have a couple of wire gates I use for my office badge. Um, seven, seven lucky listeners will get some great swag. Uh, Nova, try setting TLS skep verify equal true. Okay, so I think folks are reminding me that I might have skipped something in the docs and forgot to export a handful of... Uh, things. Also, uh, shout out to Rogerio for calling me Nova. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, yep. So folks are all like, hey, hey, export all this stuff. So let's do this and this, of course, which is number three. So I'm just jumping the gun here. So now we're going to do vault skip verify equal to true and vault status. Okay, good. This is what we want. Okay, so it wasn't the, the name uh, of the cluster. It was actually TLS. We weren't enabling a certain flag. So that's good to know. Uh, Rogerio says, you're welcome. Um, and folks are just like, yeah, Nova, what are you doing? You're, you skipped step two. It's going to fix all your problems. Uh, and Sean Smith says, Heptio, Black Girl Code is great. I'm going to be uh, running a charity stream to send some donations their way next month. Awesome. Thanks for the update, uh, Sean. OK, so going back here, uh, make sure you export your environmental variables. Uh, and don't forget this one, uh, vault skip verify equal to true, so that you don't hit the same bugs I did. And then you can run a vault status. OK, so now for the moment everyone's been waiting for. Let's talk about sealing and unsealing a vault cluster. So if you go back to the vault documentation, you can come here to concepts. And you see we have this thing called seal and unseal. And this is where. Uh, this is actually the Wikipedia article I had in the TGIK notes earlier. This is where we actually learn about Shamir's secret and how this whole thing works. So this first paragraph is actually really solid documentation. It says, uh, the data stored by Vault is encrypted. Vault needs the encryption key in order to decrypt the data. The encryption key is also stored with the data, but encrypted with another encryption key known as the master key. The master key isn't stored anywhere. So it's just several layers of encryption and security to actually have the keys to the kingdom here. And what's interesting is like if you actually think of like a bank vault, like uh, you know, like the in the movies, like with the big like dial or whatever, uh, sealing and unsealing that vault would basically be like locking and unlocking that vault. So if the vault is sealed, nobody's allowed to put anything in or to get anything out. And if it's unsealed, I just imagine like that scene in a movie where like the vault door is wide open and the bank robbers are running out. Um, and that means the vault is wide open and you're able to get things out of it. Uh, so by default, uh, it says the unseal process is, is done by running vault operator unseal. But by default, it starts off um, sealed and we have to do some initialization, initialization stuff as well. And it says, once a vault is unsealed, it remains unsealed until one of two things happens. It's either resealed, which we can do that from the command line tool or through, through the API, or you can just restart the server. So if uh, you have your vault that's open and your vault server crashes, it will uh, restart uh, itself in Kubernetes sealed. So just some important security concerns uh, to be aware of as you're looking at running vault on Kubernetes. So let's go back to our documentation. And again, I'm going to follow the steps here so I don't skip anything. Let's see what folks are saying. Uh, auto unseal was the hugest issue that we encountered when we installed Vault as deployment via Helm. Happy now with this operator, we have to migrate. So uh, yeah, so there's an auto unseal bit of functionality in Vault that will actually, I think, auto unseal your, your Vault uh, cluster so that you can begin getting and storing secrets in it automatically. Um, and by default, the operator starts off without that bit of uh, functionality enabled. OK, so let's see here. Verify that the Vault server is accepting. Uh, yes, we got that far. And it says a response confirms that the Vault CLI is ready. So next, initialize the Vault server to generate the unseal keys in the root token. So this is like whenever you get like the root password to a server for the first time, like you want to put this somewhere safe and make sure that like you're not giving these things away and probably also change them after you do it. But uh, you can actually initialize your vault. There's documentation here on actually doing this. And to do it, you type vault operator init. So the operator command, let's actually look at that really quick. Uh, vault operator minus h. 
Uh, it says this command group subcommands are for operators. So don't get confused here because, again, this is text, so we have to make everything confusing. But the vault operator subcommand has nothing to do with the vault operator itself. This is actually implying the operator as like it would apply to like a human, like a, a person operating your vault cluster, which is also how the operator pattern got named. But that's a different talk for a different day. So anyway, just be aware that vault operator has nothing to do with uh, vault operator here that we were looking at. OK, so vault operator init. Oh, and you can also, while we're here, let's just go ahead and take a look at these. You can see all of the things that an operator might want to do. So you can do a rekey or a rotate or a seal, which we just talked about what it means to seal your vault. And you can do an unseal, which we're going to do in a little bit. But first and foremost, we have to run this init subcommand. So vault operator init. Uh, OK. So I'm going to, I've already decided, my anxiety just got really high. I've already decided I'm going to share the secrets because I'm going to destroy this cluster later and I want folks to see how this is done. So like, I know I'm sharing secrets and they're not going to be, uh, you're not going to be able to use them afterwards and I'm never going to have Vault uh, exposed anywhere on the public internet. So here they are and I just need to like remind myself like it's okay Nova, it's okay to have secrets on TGIK. Uh, here are the secrets for our Vault cluster. So if you look here, we've got five unseal keys. And if you look at, let's go back here, um, initializing the vault. This is not where I want to go. I want to go back to here. Yeah, I want to have two tabs open, one with our vault operator and one with our uh, HashiCorp docs here. So if you actually look at the seal and unseal in Shamir's secret, you'll notice that you only need three keys at a time to sort of have the master key or to generate that master key. So the logic here is if you have, let's say, five operators working for you, you would give each one of them um, one of these unseal keys, and then the operator would have to go and find two of their colleagues to actually do any sort of administration on your vault cluster, which is a way of enforcing this sort of checks and balances to make sure no single person uh, has everything they need to, uh, to take down your cluster or compromise your secrets. So let's see, it says, to overcome the issue that time, the workaround was to configure an alert, Prometheus. And then once Vault restarts, the alarm is triggered and we do so manually. Okay, so again, Abdemnor is talking, ooh, my knees are locking up. Uh, Abdemnor is talking about um, how that they're dealing with the auto unseal feature. And it looks like they just set up a Prometheus alert and somebody gets alerted whenever they need to take any action. Okay, so now that we have our unseal keys, we know that we only need three of them. And we also have the second thing, this is our root token. So a token is how you actually authenticate with Vault. Uh, just real quick lesson on token trivia. Um, sorry, my knees are like going out. I'm like having to shake my knees right now. Um, token trivia, a token needs to be passed with every API request. So if we actually wanted to authenticate with Vault and then actually store or get a secret, we would need to pass a token. And we are going to talk more about how to set this up with Kubernetes in a second. But basically, this is the, the first token that allows us to write secrets and to actually interact with our, our Vault cluster. Um, so we'll need to take note of that as well. OK, so next it says unsealing a sealed node. So this command is what we ran earlier, and it's still running in a second terminal. So we can skip this part. Uh, we've already done these two environmental variables. Oh, hold on one second. I'm going to have to, like, my knee is cramping up. I have to, like, stretch it for a second. So everybody, like, go grab a cup of tea for a second. <laughs> OK, I think that got it. Mountain climber problems. OK. Also, I'm standing up here if, if folks at home don't realize that. OK, so where were we? OK, our vault adder and our vault skip verifier both set to true. And it says uh, check the active vault node. So let's go ahead and run this. Do, 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 do. And it looks like somebody's messaging me. Hold on one second. Somebody, oh, nope. I'm getting messages on Slack, and I want to make sure that uh, nobody was telling me anything important. OK, so we did our uh, vault get ex example and try to get a status. That did not work. And we are going to do this cubectal uh, other command here. Do, do, do. I feel like we skipped a step. Here it is. OK, so again, there's, there's like pointers to other bits of documentation that make it hard for me to kind of come back to this. So it says seal and unseal a vault node. So if we actually click here, seal and unseal, you can just see that you just run a vault operator unseal. And we looked at that command a moment ago. 
So we'll go ahead and run that command, vault operator unseal, and it's going to ask us for one of our unseal keys. So we'll grab our first one, and we will paste it in. So in my mind, like imagine, let's say, uh, like Sue is one of our vault operators. She, uh, she'll walk up and paste in her key, and then like we'll uh, we'll do uh, a second one here, so we can run this again. And then you know our second person walks up and they type in or paste in their unseal key, and then our third operator comes and drops their unseal key in. Um, and now that we've passed in three keys, you'll notice that here it says sealed is set to true, sealed is set to true. Uh, sealed is now set to false. So there again, like this is a little bit weird, like how it's negating itself, but sealed equals false. Another way of saying that is unsealed. So we're now able to actually store secrets in Vault and get secrets back out of Vault. Uh, Sean Smith said, did you tweak your knee during vacation? Uh, so yeah, uh, I took a week off. Uh, my partner and I, we, we flew down to Southern Utah in the desert and did uh, some pretty intense rock climbing for a week. Uh, and I might have fallen and really hurt my knee along the way, but I'm okay. It just like cramps up if I stand on it for too long. But I had a really good time and it was a really fun trip, so that's good. Uh, so anyway, we have our vault cluster unsealed. So let's go back to our docs here. Okay, so I skipped ahead earlier and it said writing secrets to the active node. So now we should be able to run this command, clear our screen, and you can see that we actually got uh, some output here. Uh, which is the uh, specific pod um, that we're looking for. Okay, and it says configure port forwarding, which we already have this command running, open a new terminal. Um, so now it's telling us to export our vault token. So let's go ahead and run this. Export vault token. And we want to do, where is it? Here. So remember this is our root token. So this is like the master keys to the kingdom here. So we have that defined. And so now we can do a vault write and a vault read. So vault write, secret foo, and let's do a vault read, secret foo, and we should get values equal to bar. Uh, poof, okay. So here's an example of us writing a secret that we are calling foo. Uh, this syntax is specific to vault as everything in vault goes through a generic write bit of functionality. And the secret folder is like a special folder for secrets. And if you actually do like a, a I think it's a vault list, I want to say. Vault secret list, maybe. Vault, no, it is vault, is it vault list secrets? Yeah. OK, so you can actually do a vault list and see that there's like different um, directories that mean different things. And as we get into the world of auth methods, which we'll get to in a little bit, we're going to learn that these directories are actually quite important. Um, but again, remember that everything in Vault goes through a generic write, which will be important when we actually look at our Go code here in a second. OK, cool. So to recap, Vault installed with the operator. It's called example, not TGIK Vault. Uh, we got it up and running. We unsealed our cluster, and we have a root token uh, exported in memory, and we're able to write and get secrets. So now let's look at how a software engineer might actually go in and start authenticating uh, with Vault. So if we go to TGIK episode 57, I have, actually, I don't even think I've merged it yet. Let's pull this up. So if you go to github.com slash heptio slash TGIK, um, I have a branch, so let's see. Did I open the pull request? I don't think so. Anyway, I'll merge it afterwards, but I have a branch in uh, Chris Nova, if you want to just pull this up on your end. Chris Nova TGIK today, and it looks like I have 57 is what it's called. And then here in episodes, scroll all the way down, we have 57, and here's our main.go file. Um, and this is what I have pulled up locally on my end here. So let's look at this in my, my IDE. OK, so here we have the world's simplest Go program. Um, let's expand our imports. And you can see we have one function. It's our main function. And we're going to go through this line by line in a second. But this is actually a good uh, starting point for us to start looking at writing secrets with Vault. So there is a Vault API. If you actually go and you type golang Vault client, they call it an API. And you can find. Uh, this is it here. 
uh, vault slash API. So if you actually go to the HashiCorp website, this is what they suggest you use for their vault. Uh, basically SDK or client if you want to write some Go code to actually get a secret or write a secret. Um, there's no readme and there's no example. So this was interesting to, uh, to get up and running. So uh, after this is merged, this is like a really great example of using Vault with Kubernetes um, that I haven't really found another working example anywhere. So this is kind of valuable stuff here. Anyway, here is all of the Go code for, uh, that Vault itself uses and that we're going to be borrowing as well for our small Go program here that we're writing. And I guess why we're on that, I'm going to segue before we go deeper into the code into uh, auth methods. Okay, so if you go here on the Vault documentation, you click on auth methods, these are all different ways that you would authenticate with Vault, which means that if you're looking at the inputs and outputs here, uh, each one of these methods would be responsible for getting you one of those tokens similar to the root token we looked at um, earlier. So uh, it suggests, uh, for example, on developer machines to use GitHub. So if you're a developer, it says there's a really easy way you can actually use GitHub to get a token so you can uh, interact with Vault. But we're not going to do that because we're running on Kubernetes. So we're going to explore this uh, Kubernetes auth method, which this is exciting because this actually lets us use our Kubernetes service account to get an, a Vault token so that uh, just by simply creating a pod in Kubernetes, we're able to authenticate with Vault uh, and access things that are running in the same service account, AKA the same namespace. And we have a small security concern when we actually look at how this whole thing kind of comes together, which is uh, what if you look here, it says, remember I mentioned everything goes through a default write. If you look here, in order to log in, you do a Vault write. Um, and then instead of doing the secrets directory, we have one called auth and we have one called Kubernetes. And this JWT is actually a really bad name because it's not a JSON web token, but it's actually the Kubernetes uh, service account token, which is basically taking a Kubernetes level secret and putting it into a different system, which means if that was ever compromised, you're basically giving away access to that entire service account uh, to another system. So there's a bit of a security concern there as well. And also I think this is just uh, a poor name choice. Okay, so let's look at actually getting this uh, auth method installed so we can start to use it. So if we scroll down here to configuration, we can see we have vault auth enable Kubernetes. So there's like a code in vault baked in that will turn on the, the Kubernetes auth backend. So this is stuff that our friends at HashiCorp wrote for us. Okay, so vault auth enable Kubernetes. Success enabled Kubernetes auth method at Kubernetes slash. So you can see there's a pattern here. We have the directory secrets, we have the directory auth, and now we have the directory Kubernetes. So this is how Vault sort of stores all of its stateful information, including your secrets, uh, which is a pretty clever design. Uh, I think so anyway. So then it says you can run this Vault write auth Kubernetes config. Um, token reviewer, it uses the reviewer service account JWT, and you give it a, a, a host here. And I'm wondering if we can just leave that host address as is. I actually haven't done this before, so this is really me doing some of this live. So if I stumble here, feel free to jump in the chat and let me know. Okay, so vault write, it says failed to parse k equal v data, invalid key pair. Kubernetes ca cert equals at ca cert, error reading file, open ca cert, no such file or directory. What's going on here? Uh, for the list of available configuration options. So do I actually have to get my real Kubernetes CA cert in order for this thing to work? I think I do. Uh, where are we gonna get? I know there's CA information stored on the Kubernetes node itself. So let's go check there. So I'm thinking we wanna get the CA cert off of a, our master copy it here locally and then try to authenticate with Vault. Um, anybody has a better idea, feel free to, to yell at me now. Do do. Go into my DevNova account. EC2, two running instances. Let's find our master. So here's our master. We can copy this. This is a bit hacky, but we can do an SSH Ubuntu at blah. We'll just sudo up now for good measure. And I think it's Etsy Kubernetes, I wanna say. Um, PKI, hey, look what I found. Uh, we have our ca.cert. So let's cat ca.cert. I'm gonna do this off the screen uh, just for good measure. Doo -doo. 
I'm going to copy this to my clipboard, clear my screen, and then bring this one back over here. Oh, and how do I do the tab thing? I'm going to cheat and create a new tab so I can drag my old tab and delete this terminal. And there we go. Oh, clear that. <laughs> All right, I'll just close that terminal for now. We'll open up a new tab and resume in. OK, so we have the Sierra cert in my clipboard. And let's go here. And let's do another nano to speed things up. We'll call it CA cert. And I'll paste this off the screen here. And save that. OK, cool. So new tab again, zoom in, resize. Let's see what folks are saying in chat. Uh, Donald Guy said, I had to open a browser, so kind of too late, but you just need your public key.cert, isn't in your cube config? Uh, so yeah, I think it is, but I thought that was, I don't think that's the actual raw cert material. I thought it was something else. But either way, uh, I'll try that, Donald, as a second approach if this doesn't work. Um, so let's go back and look at our docs and see what it says here. Do do. And also, thanks for joining and helping me out, Donald. I appreciate it. Um, so I'm wondering, so this is just a great example of poor documentation, because this doesn't really tell me concretely what needs to happen here or what Vault is expecting. Like, do I pass in a, uh, a file here? Do I actually paste my cert information? Will it work with both? Um, so there's a little bit of trial and error here to try to figure out how to get this uh, Kubernetes config uh, working. So it says token reviewer. So I think that's fine. Kubernetes host. So I'm wondering if I can just do my Kubernetes host and my CA cert directly from my kube config and call this thing a day. Let's try that first. So we will actually do this. Um, how do I want to do this? Let's open this up as a file here in, in TJIK. So we'll just make a bash script. Uh, we're going to call this config.sh, just so we can kind of like edit things real time. Ben bash. So here's our command, and let's get our host and paste it in. Let's see. Looks like Donald's saying some stuff. He says the at syntax is not super common thing that so pr some programs do to equate cat, so it's a file name. Uh, and tinfoil Matt says yes, you can. Unsure what he's or tinfoil Matt is suggesting. Yes, I can do. Uh, again, complete sentences are always helpful. Um, but if you didn't put the at, it would be content. OK, I see. It's just uh, some weird implied syntax that I've never seen before. Uh, and now it looks like tinfoil Matt says the at syntax won't work. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually not do the at syntax. And I'm going to actually paste in my CA cert material from my cube config here. Uh, you know what, YOLO, at this point, if we're going to do this, let's just do it. Uh, cat cube slash config. Um, do, do. And I have a lot of Kubernetes up and running here, and none of these are uh, actual real ones anymore. I'll spare you all me going through my cube config, though. Uh, so there's mini cube. Let's see, clusters, cube config. Let's search for name, uh, 57057. Uh, I think it's called admin, maybe? Kubernetes admin, yeah. Auth provider, access token, expiry key, client cert, cert data. OK, so this is already starting to frustrate me a bit. This would be way easier if there was like a, somebody like baked all of this logic in, and you could just point vault to your cube config, and it would do everything it needed to do. So this is just frustrating. Uh, let's see what folks in chat are saying. Uh, you need to paste the whole cert in there. OK, so. Back to my cube config here. I know it's off screen, so it's a bit hard. So I'm just trying to walk folks through what I'm doing. But I am pulling up my cube admin cluster by grepping for admin. And do do. That's GKE. Sorry, I seriously have like 45 Kubernetes clusters here. I'm having to kind of go through to figure out which one we want to use. Um, so that's GKE. Don't know what that one is. Oh, that's Minikube. More GKE, more Minikube. More Cubicorn. Do two, more Minikube. OK, we're going to try this a different way. We're going to build these things manually. OK, so for our Kubernetes cluster, our master is here. So we'll grab that. We'll go back to our bash script. And we're going to paste here. 
and that's listening on 443. And let's actually see if that's here. That IP address is here in my kubeconfig. Let me grab for that. 34 dot. Yeah, there it is. OK, cool. And I have certificate authority data. I have, sorry, manually reading YAML is always a big pain. I guess let's try cluster cert certificate authority data. So let's grab all of this. And I'm going to do this off the screen as well. So give me a second here. Bam and bam. And now let's go here and actually run this thing. OK, so I pasted the assert data and the public IP address of my master node and changed the port to 443. So this should work if we uh, go to that bash file and run it, github.com. Heptio, TGIK, episodes, what episode? Are, I can't believe we're already on 57 episodes. OK, so sh config.sh. Failed to write config. Uh, cannot validate service because 127 because it doesn't contain any IP SANS. Ah, because of those environmental flags, um, environmental variables again. So because I started a new um, terminal, I lost those environmental config bits. So now let's try this sh config. Error making API requests put permission denied. Uh, oh, probably because I need my root token defined again. Did I lose my root token? I bet I did. If I lost my root token, then we're really SOL here. Yeah, I think I did because I closed. Maybe is it here on the screen? Um, I think we lost our root token, folks, because I closed that terminal. Uh, so yeah, let's figure out how to rekey with Vault. Why not, right? So we might actually be like really up, up the creek here. If I lost my root token, I'm assuming we need that to rekey. And if we can't authenticate with the API, we might as well nuke Vault and start all over. Um, so let's see. It says, when you did Cubectal get Vault OYAML, how did you specify the operator information? Always use OYAML with a space. I'm reading David's comment in chat right now. Uh, so I thought of you were using a special operator YAML, LOL. Uh, we could rewind the stream to get the root token. That sounds noisy. I think uh, it might be uh, easier for me because we do have the operator in place to just nuke it and recreate it. So how we would do that is we would do k get vault. Watch this hackery here. This is going to be exciting. k get vault. Uh, Here's the OYAML bit again, which basically is output YAML, pipe to PB copy, bam, k delete vault example. Uh, and then we can do cat, or we can do PB paste, PB paste, pipe to uh, cubectal create. Ah, that did not work. Uh, let's do this. Uh, example.yaml. And I know it has our status and everything in it, but it should still work was my point I wanted to uh, show with folks. So example.yaml. Cool. So now if we do kget vault, we have an example. So let's give you know vault another 20 or 30 seconds. We'll unseal it real quick, and we'll have root tokens, and we'll be back to off to the races again. See? Uh, operators, they work well in the wild. Um, so I'll keep this terminal closed. Let's see what folks in chat are saying. Uh, Sean Smith says, typing out root key. No, it's OK, Sean. Uh, I've already uh, gone through and recreated it. So we can just do a new one really quick. Oh, well, um, yeah, whatever. And then I guess this is a perfect lesson. Like, if you're doing this for real, once you get this information, like, put it somewhere, like, keep it safe, keep it secret. Or what is it? Keep it secret, keep it safe right away. OK, so let's check and see KGPO. So we're still waiting for that to come up. Um, so. Let's go back to my bash script here and pull this thing back up. I'm only going to share a small portion of it, but here is what we have for folks at home if they want to see. Uh, so this, I believe, stays the same. This is just my Kubernetes public server listening on port 443. And then this is just straight out of my uh, kubeconfig file here for Kubernetes CA cert. Uh, David says, how can you list all operators in the namespace? Uh, David, uh, my kdom command is great, but I, I, are you trying to ask how you would list all of the, the vault CRs? Or I'm unsure what you're asking. And Sean says, yeah, I had to rewind the video and did type it out. But YouTube blocked it since I rewound. I didn't see the delete. 
Okay. Uh, if you want to send it to me on Twitter or Slack or something, go for it. But uh, I have a feeling I'll beat you here just because uh, the vault operator. Nope, still container creating. Uh, Donald Guy says, I also suspect you need to base64 decoded. Okay. So that's why I wanted to just log in straight and get it off the server. But yeah, I can do a, a base64 really quick. We'll grab that. So let's see, what is it? Base 64, is it minus D? I always forget how to do a base 64 decode. Minus capital D. So let's do echo this um, pipe to base 64 capital D pipe to PB copy. Cool, clear that. Go back to our bash script. Bam. Uh, open up our Docker file just to get that off the screen. Sharing secrets makes me so nervous. Cool. Uh, let's go back and check. Do do kgitpo. Still waiting on containers to create. Uh, Donald says capital D on BSD, Mac O lowercase d on Linux. Yeah, I know it's, it's like one of those commands that no matter how many times I've ran it, I always, it's like tar. Like I always have to go look it up every time because it's just always just different enough and I run it just infrequently enough. So annoying. Okay, so I'm wondering why this is taking so long. Uh, container vaults. Container still creating. Hmm. How are our nodes doing? K get nodes. Those look fine. So I don't see any reason why Kubernetes wouldn't be able to create pods right now. Is it just pulling down the vault image? What's going on here? I wonder if there's some sort of bug with the vault operator if you give it the same name. Let's try to change the name really quick. Uh, so let's go go source github.com. Do, 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 heptio, tg. No, we don't want to go there. We want to go go source github.com core OS vault operator. And let's Emacs example. Uh, what was it called? Vault C. Nope, not vault CRD. It was example. Example vault.yaml. Let's try to give it a new name and see what happens. Uh, TGIK, save, K delete vault example, K apply minus F example, example vault yaml created, K get PO. Okay, so let's try to run this and hope for the best and see what happens. Uh, Jeremy says, sharing secrets makes me service. Pretty appropriate in a session about vault. Yeah, well, it's, it's one of those things where it's like just being on the screen and knowing that I'm getting recorded. Like just anytime there's secret information, I just kind of like, just like gives me like, hits that certain part of like my spine where I'm like, ah, get that off the screen. Uh, so like trying to unlearn the, the behavior there. It's just interesting, but I'm glad you liked it, Jeremy. Let's check our pods and see what's going on now. Hey, this looks better. So yeah, it looks like we found a bug in the uh, the vault operator, which uh, looks like it has a problem trying to redeploy uh, the same pod for some reason. Uh, Bob says, just assert isn't a secret sale for normal PKI scenarios. Have a cert on your screen as long as the private key isn't published. Uh, so yeah, Bob's just uh, helping us out here with understanding uh, the true secrets and the difference between just shared keys and secrets. Um, which again, I just put everything like it's it's some sort of uh, cert material, so it should just never be shared ever, and that is usually my philosophy. Okay, so kgit po. Um, okay, so here's tgik. So now let's do our port forward thing again, which is here. I promise we're almost, we're almost here. We're gonna get this thing to work. Uh, and then we wanna change this from vault example to TGIK. Bam. Uh, is it not running yet? Uh, K get vaults. Yeah, there's one called TGIK. Uh, Sean Smith says, gotta run. See you guys next time. Uh, stupid, tinfoil Matt says, stupid question. How is vault different from secrets? Uh, and uh, Sean says, and girl, sorry, my bad. You're good, Sean. Thanks for hanging out. 
Uh, so yeah, tinfoil, Matt. Um, basically, I think what you're asking is how is Vault different from the Kubernetes secret store? Um, they both kind of solve the same problem, although Vault's encryption and security behind the scenes is way more advanced. Uh, if you're looking at truly storing secret information for your org, uh, something like Vault is exciting because it actually goes through and, and does a really nice job at encrypting everything and securing everything. So just more security is the TLDR there. Uh, Sean says, see you next time. So let's try to do our port forward again. Still not wanting to work. Uh, K get vault dash OEML. Let's see what's going on here. Uh, status, initialize false, phase running, updated nodes. Why is the uh, port forward? Uh, tinfoil Matt says, I see, makes sense. I thought they complemented each other. So that goes back to the dynamic secrets that we talked about earlier. There's actually a blog out there that talks about how you can use uh, Vault and Kubernetes secrets in harmony together, which is a little bit different than the off, me off method that we're looking at today. Uh, OK, so let's look at this port forward command and see what's going on. OK, cubectal namespace default, git vault tgik, output json path, status vault status active and then pipe that to port forward. So I guess status vault status active is in status vault status active. Uh, let's see what's going on here. K get PO. Uh, let's actually look at these logs. So K logs, the name of our pod, minus F minus C vaults. Uh, security barrier not initialized. What's going on here? Uh, maybe restart the pod and hope for the best. I don't know. I'm not a vault expert by any means, so I don't know what the security barrier not initialized thing means. Uh, you need to unseal to get active status. Use the previous port forward, is what Zsolt is saying in the doc. Use this port forward? Oh, I see what you're saying. Use this one here. Okay, because it looks like the JSON path is different. Ah, good call, Zsolt. Or Zsolt, I'm not sure. Uh, example, and we want to change this to TGIK. Good find. I thought they were the same. Uh, already in use here. So uh, let's actually do that one here. Uh, and we'll just keep this tab minimized in the background. OK, so change this to TGIK. OK, port forwarding back and running. So we're going to keep this terminal. We're not going to close it. And we're going to do a vault operator init. Get our keys. Uh, real quick, we're just going to write these down. I'm not going to commit this, but I just don't want to uh, uh, master info, whatever. Paste all that stuff. So now we at least have a copy in case anything does happen again. Um, and now we can do our vault operator unseal again. And Sue's going to walk over and paste her key. And we'll run it again and paste our second one. Bam, bam. And our last one we'll get here. Uh, let's see, sealed is equal to false. OK, good. So then we want to export our root token. So we'll grab our root token, export, what is it? Let's check and see. I want to make sure I get this right. Export. Vault root, nope. Where was it at? Vault token. See, this is why I checked. Export vault token equal to this thing. OK, so now I should be able to do a vault status. Good, very good. So now let's go back and run this config command again. Uh, so we'll open up a new tab for that, zoom in. Uh, I'm just kind of treating this tab delicately now. Uh, so let's go to go source github.com, heptio tgik episodes 057, and we should have uh, shconfig.sh. Uh, oh, let me fix my command here. And let's see what people are saying in the chat. Uh, oh, nothing. It looked like somebody was typing, but I guess not. Uh, so let's go back to our config.sh. Um, how would I get this all in one line the easy way? Can I just like do this the lazy way? I don't want to have to do the EOF thing. That sounds so annoying. And so does deleting all this information. So I'm going to cheat and do this here. 
So we'll copy this and put it into a file and we will use the at syntax. That's what we want to do. So let's do uh, nano ca.cert, paste this. Ugh, what happened there? Cancel. Uh, no. And where was our pipe command? Did we lose that thing too? Uh, yeah, because I pulled this out of uh, my cube config. So let's see. Do some editing here. You guys are getting to watch me hack Rama. Okay, bam. Now let's create our CA cert file. See, it would be really nice if there was a layer of software doing this for us so I didn't have to go through and manually tinker with all this noise. Okay, so ca.cert, paste, yes. Um, so then we can go back to our shell script here and we want to do ca.cert, which is how it was originally. Okay, so we should be able to run that now. You need token reviewer JWT from the service account secret token. Uh, I don't think we need that just yet, but we'll try. Um, we can get that in a second if we need to, George, but I don't think we should need that because we're going to get that from the pod at runtime. Um, but again, not a security expert, just trying to figure this out. Okay. Oh, we were trying to run our shell script. And that is not there. That is going to be here in episode 57, sh config.sh. Error writing data. Uh, oh, because we want to run it in this one where we have all of our environmental variables set. So actually, I can just do my TGIK alias and then change episodes 57, 057, and now run our config.sh. Error writing to auth Kubernetes config put no handler for route. Oh, because I have to do the Kubernetes enable thing again. So Kubernetes auth method, it's this thing, vault and auth enable Kubernetes. And now we should be able to run, Ugh, why won't you work? Uh, writing data to auth Kubernetes, error occurred, not a compact JWS. So it looks like Gregory was right, or George was right, sorry. So uh, one way we can get our service account that's going to be relevant to later because this is going to be how we get it from the pod is to actually get a pod into the default namespace and then look on the file system for the service account token. Um, you can also get it through secrets using Kubectl, but I want to do this really quick uh, so I can show how we're going to be mounting it on the pod later. So if we come into our default namespace, we can actually do a uh, run a debugging pod. And this is just going to run Ubuntu latest in the default namespace. Uh, if you don't see a command prompt, press enter, press enter, we're here. And then uh, remember earlier I had mentioned that client go link I found, which is, where was it? Uh, service account token. So this is where we want to get our service account token, which again, this is like giving away keys to the kingdom here. Uh, so just be mindful of this. If you do ever get this thing off your, off your pod, you don't really want to send this outside of Kubernetes ever. Um, so I'm going to do, I guess it's okay. I'll share it. At the, I mean, we're already committed at this point. I'll just do it here. Okay. Cat service account. Uh, oop. Oh, and you can't tab hint. So let's do this. Change directory here, list, uh, and then you can just cat out the token here. Okay, cool. So that's our token. Ah. And then we can exit Crex and clear our screen. Okay. So now let's go back here and let's pass in our Kubernetes service account token. That looks good. And sh config. Dot sh. Yay, we finally got it. Uh, data written to auth Kubernetes config. Okay, so uh, super annoying, uh, but we were able to get it. So you need to get your CA cert, and this is like going to be like a tongue twister, right? Get your CA cert information out of the cube config, base 64, decode it, find your master API server uh, endpoint, probably from your cube config. I used Amazon. And then you also need to get your service account token, and we showed you how to get it um, off of a pod running in the default service account anyway. So anyway, now we finally enabled the Kubernetes auth method. Uh, and again, like <laughs> I couldn't really find a good step-by-step -step on, on doing that anywhere on the internet. So there you go. We just got it all taken care of.
Okay, so moving forward, uh, where is Kubernetes auth method? Okay, so we got this step finally done, and it says now create a role. Uh, so you can do this, and it's let's look at what's going on here. So we're creating a new uh, vault entry called auth Kubernetes role demo. So the name of our role is demo, and we're going to bind that to uh, vault auth in namespace default, and we're going to give it a TTL of one hour with a default policy here. So this is just, uh, if you want to find out more about this, Vault has a ton of information, but this is just a Vault-ism for setting up uh, Kubernetes and giving us a simple role. Let's see what folks are saying. Uh, Donald Guy says, pipe to context cluster, cluster CI cert data, base64 decode, ca.cert. Okay, so Donald Guy just dropped a one-liner in for getting that out. Um, which is handy. You know, if somebody wants to write a bash script to like basically take this little command I wrote and actually do the lookups and do everything, I bet that would be greatly appreciated for folks on the internet so they don't have to f fight with everything like I just did. Okay, so anyway, let's create this role. Bam. Uh, data written to auth Kubernetes role demo. Okay, cool. So the role authorizes the vault auth service account in the default namespace and gives it the default policy. Uh, it looks like Waleed had a big excitement bit there. Okay, so now we're going to get exciting stuff going on here, and I know we're already an hour and 36 minutes in, so uh, I'm sort of sitting here thinking how deep down the rabbit hole do we want to get, um, because I actually did put a lot of work into getting this Go code running, and again, there isn't really a good example of this anywhere on the internet. Uh, so. If you want this, I'll merge it after the episode here. If you want a copy of working code of using the vault, um, uh, the vault default, I guess we can call it the SDK, or the client or the API, I think is what they call it in the repository. Um, this is a working example. And we're not going to go ahead and deploy this because we are almost out of time, but we can walk through what's going on here and so folks get an idea of what this would look like and the user experience would be like. So the first thing we do is we create this config object and we're pointing it to localhost uh, 8200. Um, and this is going to be the address of your vault server. So inside of Kubernetes, we would actually change this to use kubedns and the name of our deployment. So we would get that by doing a uh, kget deploy, I think. Um, and we have tgik. So you could just do uh, https colon backslash backslash tgik, and then you would need a service here uh, on listening on connecting port 8200 to the deployment. So let's see, kget svc. Um, and we do have one here, and it's on 8200. And that's also called tgik. So we now know that we would be able to change this from localhost to just tgik, which is the name of our deployment. OK, so you would do that. Um, you would then call api.newclient. And if you actually look, this API thing is the actual HashiCorp vault API Go uh, package that we looked at earlier. Um, you pass in your config, um, and you can do a logger critical OS exit if something goes wrong. So that's nothing too exciting. You probably want to have better exit uh, error handling there. This is just demo code, so I'm just going to just kill it right then. And this is where we get into the exciting part here. And this is where like the whole point of the episode kind of comes together. OK, so sorry, something in my throat. We do an IOU till read file. And remember that uh, this is what we catted out in the pod earlier. So we're actually getting the Kubernetes uh, service account token off of disk. This is, this is mounted on every pod in Kubernetes automatically. So we have the bytes here in memory. And let's start uncommenting some of this stuff. So then we start to actually define our options here. And how I was able to structure this map interface is if you go, I think here, yeah. So this is, uh, this is where I got it from, is this little snippet of JSON here. So it says JWT, your service account JWT, which remember that's just our Kubernetes service account token. Um, and then we say role is equal to demo. Um, so that's the role we just created. So let's go back to our Go code. And we're going to change this to, this is just left over for me playing earlier today. Role is equal to demo. And then we're just going to take a string of uh, our bytes that we got um, off of disk earlier. So then we define our path here um, for our request, which remember everything in Vault goes through a default write. So all we're doing to log in is we're just issuing another write command, which again, documentation on that was also almost non-existent. Uh, Donald Guy says, FYI, your OBS setup is shadowing top chat, not live chat, so it only shows second half of my one-liner. Okay, uh, and presumably drops other stuff occasionally. 
Okay. Uh, thanks for the update, Donald. Um, if you want to add that to the hack and D or something, I'm sure folks would appreciate it. Um, the YouTube chat is just usually just being a, is just a pain. Okay, so anyway, um, we define our path that we're gonna do our vault write to, which is auth Kubernetes login. We then get our secret, um, which is gonna be called from doing client. Uh, we actually have to call this thing called logical, which is uh, another vault-ism, and that's where we get this default write. And we do our path, which is defined here, and our options, which we defined above. And this returns a secret. And so we can uncomment our error check here. Again, it just exit if something goes wrong. And now we actually get our token. So we were able to generate a token to authenticate with Vault from our Kubernetes service account. So you can come in and you can uncomment all of that. And so this token is like, this is what we've been waiting for the whole time. Uh, and we can go in and we can actually comment this. And then we can do client set token so that we're actually using that token with every request. And then we can finally, now that we have an authenticated token that matches a role we created, come through and actually do a write. Um, and then we would be able to run this in Kubernetes by, I was gonna flush this out live during TGIK, but we're already pretty far behind on time. Uh, if, I, if anybody wants to help me finish this up and actually get a working demo, feel free to, to poke around at it. Uh, but basically all I would do is write a Docker file that would go and run this and we would be able to do a uh, TGIK secret um, write and a TGIK secret uh, read, which is this printf down here at the, vol at the bottom. Um, using our Kubernetes default service account. Um, and Samas says, is that text editor visual code? No, I use uh, uh, Goland. It used to be Gogland, now it's Goland. Uh, which, let's see, can I do like an about? Yeah, this is what I used. Uh, Goland, and I'm running uh, 2018.1. I actually paid for it uh, just because I know the folks who work on it. They're, they're active gophers and they're friends of mine. So I like to uh, help them out. This is one of the few pieces of software I've actually paid for in my career because I believe in it so much. Uh, so yeah, I use Goland and I paid for it and you should too. Um, but yeah, this is an example of some Go code. Uh, and I think the powerful bit here that folks at home are probably interested in is that uh, as a software engineer, I don't have to concern myself with secret information. In other words, I'm able to authenticate and get and write secrets at my leisure um, simply by running in Kubernetes. So simply by having my program run in Kubernetes, I can access this token and that token gives me everything I need to go and interact with Vault. So things like MySQL credentials or anything that uh, my program would be interested in using, I don't ever have to hard code. I don't ever have to mess around with fussing with environmental variables. I just have this little um, read my Kubernetes service account token and then generate a vault token from that, which of course, as I mentioned earlier, is terrifying and dangerous, but it does make my life as a software engineer uh, much easier. So there we have it, some Go code if you want to tinker with it for a starting place to work at home and getting your vault token and actually doing a read and write with vault that is only possible by running this in Kubernetes. Um, I will do my best to tidy up this Docker repo, but we are way overdue on time. So I'm going to zone out and see if folks uh, have any questions or anything. So let's see, go back to my face. Bam, here I am. Tinfoil Matt says, this will help in rotating secrets also. So yeah, so that's a really good point. Um, now, however secrets are managed behind the scenes, me as a software engineer, I don't have to care about that. My code never changes. An operator can come in and, and circulate secrets as often as they want and my code will always work uh, and I won't have to be a code change or I won't have to like make a, an update to the PR or anything. So let's see what folks are saying. Uh, Aaron says, console template is also really useful for generating YAML and such from Vault. Good tip. Uh, George says, we use an init container to fetch secrets from Vault and write to a PVC so that a service can source that file. Wondering if any suggestions on a better way to get secrets from Vault to, uh, con to well, you said a C-O-N-T-S end. Um, I think what you're implying is a continuous environment. Um, so I think that's an okay approach that's real similar to like how some of the sidecar authy stuff works as well, is just having an init container to do a lot of the, the uh, authy noise stuff. Um, but in general, like, yeah, he said containers. Um, so basically what he's asking is a better way to get secrets from Vault to the containers environment. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, other than similar code like we have here, I would probably write a lot, like a package to wrap a lot of this up in. And so that a software engineer can simply like vendor a package and just say like vault auth and then just poof, they don't have to deal with any of the tokeny reading stuff from disk. And we could build like a really nice complex feature rich library around even checking to see if this file is here and, you know, making sure that we unset memory as quickly as possible and stuff like that. Uh, so that would be my approach as an engineer. But again, there's a lot of ways to skin this cat. Um, so anyway, we are out of time. So thank you everyone for joining, uh, getting Vault up and running and looking at actually getting uh, uh, a pod running with Kubernetes and connecting that up to the Kubernetes auth backend, which remember is different than the dynamic secret stuff, which maybe we can do another TGIK on that in the future. Um, but yeah, it's been great hanging out with everyone. Uh, I'm gonna get this repo, uh, my, my fork of the TGIK stuff up and merged as quickly as possible so folks can see this code here. But if anybody else has any other questions, feel free to let me know. It's been a great episode. Uh, Marco says, great and very informative episode. Thank you, Marco. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, thanks everyone <laughs> for joining. This is always the weird part because I'm like giving myself like an extra 30 seconds here for folks to say bye and giving folks another opportunity to ask questions if they have questions. Uh, Tinfoil Matt says, thank you, keep up the good work. Heptio is cool. Mm -hmm. Marco says, time to sleep. I know, well, it's the middle of the night, I think, for Marco. Mm -hmm. They live on the other side of the world. Okay, but it's been really rad joining everyone. So thanks for joining. If you have any questions, hit me up on Twitter. Hit me up on Slack. I'm always here. I'm down to talk. Uh, let's see what folks are saying now. Um, Zolt says, this was great. Thanks again. Have a great weekend. Waleed says, thank you and have a nice weekend. Sima says, thank you for the tutorial. Keep up the good work. Donald, thanks for your help today, uh, especially with the base 64 stuff. That was really rad. Uh, Marcos, like he said, going back to bed. Jeremy says thanks as usual. And uh, I, somebody else said thanks. I'm not going to try to mispronounce your name. Sorry. OK, it's been rad. We'll see everybody next week. If you have any ideas for next week, hit me up on Twitter. And I am going to go home and get ready for Thanksgiving. And I'll be climbing Mount Hood, the North Face, this weekend. So if anybody is uh, on the north side of Mount Hood, look up on that nice open north face and look for a red jacket, you might see me. Okay, talk to everyone later. Thanks again. Bye.